tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Unfortunately, riot police stormed into the airport to suppress on peaceful activists. Hong Kong International Airport closed again as protesters clashed with police. Also, I'm very, very disappointed. Broken Beast, a popular ride malfunctions at Playland. And. Hello. Oh, hello. Unlikely roommates, the benefits of mixed generation living. This is CBC Vancouver News. Batons, tear gas, and cancelled flights at Hong Kong's International Airport Tuesday. For the first time, riot police pushed into the terminal building to try to force the protesters out. Dozens of flights have been cancelled over the past two days. It's Wednesday there now, and the airport has just reopened. But after days of violence between pro-democracy protesters and police, it's not clear what happens next. And although things quieted down overnight, protesters say they will be back again. Good evening. Some local passengers stuck in Hong Kong when the airport was first shut down say it was a scary scene. As Leanne Young reports tonight, they arrived here in Vancouver on an Air Canada flight this morning. Uh, we are very, very worried about when the police come, so I tell her we, we need to walk, we need to get out from the airport. That was what Ray Wong told his six-year-old yesterday after finding out their flight out of Hong Kong to Vancouver was cancelled. After seeing hordes of protesters and days of police action on the streets, he was afraid of what could happen. How do they know we are not the protesters? Yeah, so uh, we, we are very worried when will the police come and when will they take action. But getting out of the airport wasn't as easy as it sounds. No taxi, no bus, no train, no railway. No yeah. And so the family walked for an hour before someone, Wong thinks volunteer protesters, offered them a ride. They weren't the only travelers who stood by fearing for their safety. We are scary, actually. You know, there's lots of people you don't know when they will evacuate and uh, will they move into the uh, inside the uh, airport. Nobody knows. Of course, we're afraid because at any time they could have foreign tear gas. Everyone tried to leave, but there were no buses. Yvette Wang grew up in Hong Kong but now calls Vancouver home. She believes in the freedoms being sought, but seeing the protests in person was heartbreaking. I root for both sides. We're all human. Um, those that are doing the policing, I, I think it's quite scary that, you know, you got hordes of people going at you. You don't have time to think twice what you're about to do to protect yourself and your duty. The passengers arriving today were lucky, getting off the ground during a window between closures. Late this afternoon, the airport shut down again and violence erupted. Multiple arrests taking place and worries that China is flexing its military might just across the border. Wang is now fearing the worst. I hope the government will come out and say something, do something, so it will stop, but I don't think it's likely. Uh, my guess is like someone get hurt or get killed and maybe it will stop. A guess that no one wants to see realized, but a worry that keeps on growing. Leanne Young, CBC News, Richmond. Now, the protests have been going on for more than two months now. Sparked by fears, Beijing is aiming to take more control over Hong Kong. And now with the busy airport at the center of the political unrest, the rest of the world has no choice but to take notice. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher has more. Violence erupts at Hong Kong International Airport. Check-in counters closed, flights canceled, the epicenter of political unrest as police clash with protesters. We almost have a stampede because we were such, in a, such a panic. We were in such a blind fear of the police. Demonstrators say what started as a peaceful sit-in quickly turned to chaos when riot police suddenly stormed the airport terminal armed with batons and pepper spray. One police officer even pulled out a gun when protesters went at him. We were trying to stop the police from entering. I didn't really question what I was doing. I just want to tell, let them know that what they're doing is wrong. 
At one point, protesters detained a man they claimed was an undercover police officer. He was tied to a luggage cart as throngs of people crowded around. This was the second straight day demonstrators brought the airport to a standstill, taking their frustration and demands to the international stage. The protest started as a push against a controversial extradition bill that could see those accused of crimes sent to China. Ever since, Hong Kong's leader has been dogged by questions of just how much Beijing controls her. Do you have the autonomy or not to withdraw the extradition she bill? Has your question, you, you have not answered the question. You've Sorry. evaded the question. Beijing warns these demonstrations are bordering on terrorism. Chinese state media has shown convoys of paramilitary police converging in the border city of Shenzhen. The unrest isn't just at the airport. Those who live in Hong Kong say it's divided the whole city. You know, everyone's taking a side. Everyone is uh, talking about this story. If you go to work in the morning, you don't know if your subway is going to even be full of protesters or not. And uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Ten weeks in with both sides digging in, the fear is this political crisis will only get more violent. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, one of Playland's most popular rides is out of commission. The Beast broke down last night while people were actually on it. CBC News at 11 host Dan Burrett is live at Playland tonight. So, Dan, when is the ride expected to reopen? They don't know right now, uh, Manita and Mike. And as you can see, the Beast is paused behind us. Playland staff say, will, they say they will take as long as it takes to make sure the ride is safe after they inspect it to make sure that it's good to go for customers. Now, inspectors were on site today checking over the massive pendulum swing. Playland staff say around 3 p.m. yesterday, riders and people online were hearing a terrible grinding sound and then some oil poured out of the machine. Scary for those on board and on the ground, but thankfully no one was hurt. They say the problem happened on the upper part of the ride, and it was a mechanical issue, but they need to do more to figure out what happened. Take a listen. It'll re-enter when the time is right and when it's gone through the proper procedure to get it back and so that we are confident that the ride is ready to re-enter our ride roster. What I will say is there's a number of procedures to go through. Assessing what happened, fixing the part that is broken and then from there going through the re-inspection process in order for the, we can be very confident in, where, in the condition of the ride and where it is moving forward. So you could probably hear behind me plenty of other rides on right now, but the shutdown of the beast also comes as several other large rides here at the at Playland are shut down. The Gladiator is shut down because it needs a part. And if you look behind me, you see the old wooden coaster here since 1958. It is shut down because staff say that it needs to be inspected. It's uh, one of those rides that's been here for a long time and one of the oldest. That's because the because it's a wooden coaster, when it was wet and when it was raining, the wood expanded and when we got that hot weather, it dried out. And so they need to reinspect that. Hopefully they can have that up and running in the next few days. As for the beast, like they, like they said, they'll take as long as they need to in order to make sure it's safe for riders again. Anita, Mike? Dan Burrett, live at Playline tonight. Thank you. Repairing the damage to the Cedar Sky gondola after its main cable was cut is going to cost more and take longer than previously estimated. The company says the cable that was believed to be cut is from France and is incredibly strong. It's about the thickness of a beer can and is made up of several strands made of steel and other material. It'll cost millions to replace all the destroyed and damaged components. The general manager warns hikers and the curious not to come close to get a better look because of the danger to them and his crews. This is still very dangerous. I just can't stress that enough. Um, you know, the, the, there are there are cabins uh, caught in trees and on the sides of uh, cliffs, and it's, it's very dramatic and, and I think compelling to some people to come and take a look. But but you're just putting your you are putting your life at risk. Uh, you don't know when things are going to move. We don't know when things are going to move. We're stabilizing things as quickly as we can, uh, but we will not put our team in harm's way. Uh, to do so, uh, and we sure don't want to have to go out and rescue somebody. And he says they still don't know how long it will take to get the rope, cabins, and other materials from suppliers, but he promises they will be open and running as soon as they can. The Fort St. John man arrested for Facebook posts praising ISIS four years ago will have to stay in jail a little longer. 
Othman Hamdan was ordered released from jail and into the care of a friend in early August with 26 conditions. Those included regular contact with Canada Border Services, no internet access, no Facebook posts, no weapons, no driving, and a curfew. But that wasn't enough for the CBSA, and it asked for the release to be halted, alleging Hamden is still a danger to the public. Hamden now faces a judicial review of the release order. Some American tourists had a rare and terrifying encounter while camping in Banff National Park. The family of four was asleep in their tent when they were attacked by a wolf. The father grappled with the snarling animal while it tried to push its way into the tent. Eventually, their cries for help were heard by a neighboring camper who rushed to see what was wrong and was shocked to find the wolf trying to drag the man out of the collapsed tent. The screams were so intense yeah. um, that I knew it was obviously a terrible situation so I just kind of kept running at it and I just kicked it in the um, sort of in the back hip area like I was kicking in a door. I don't think I heard it very much it was pretty large but uh, it startled it enough that I think it let Matt go and it sort of stumbled out. As soon as it popped out of the tent Matt came flying out um, half his his whole half side was just covered in blood oh. um, but he was pretty amped up too mm -hmm. so um, we both just started screaming at it um, and it backed away a little bit. The family and Fee were able to chase the wolf away by shouting and throwing rocks long enough to take shelter in a nearby vehicle. The father suffered punctures and cuts on his arms and hands, but he's going to be okay. Parks Canada tracked the wolf and killed it about a kilometer from the campground. It says attacks like this are extraordinarily rare. Well, flying may be the fastest way to get from point A to point B, but that convenience comes at an environmental cost. Air travel is a big contributor to climate change, and as Jacqueline Hansen reports, there are some homegrown solutions to try to make flying more sustainable. For decades, the same routine. Fuel up and take off. But Harbor Air's old seaplane technology is getting a jolt of innovation. It's going electric. We've basically stripped everything out of this aircraft. Goodbye noisy piston engine and fuel tanks. Hello batteries. There's lots of room in here for them, but they are substantially heavier. It's a catch-22 when trying to electrify aircraft. The heavier the batteries, the more energy the plane needs to fly. But the BC-based airline's shortest flights could be doable. Most of its routes are within half an hour of, of the original destination. So that enables us to use this technology a lot sooner than, than others. In Ontario... Yeah, it, uh, it looks uh, uh, like there's a lot in there. And that's because a father and son uh, want to combine uh, old uh, and new. It's the world's most expensive model airplane, I think. This is a prototype of the Horizon Aircraft's hybrid plane. The five-seater aircraft will be able to switch from gas to electric or use both at the same time. Leveraging the battery power that you have on board to burn as little fuel as possible. So a uh, really more economical way to fly, burning less fuel, but also um, producing less emissions. But it's being designed for people with a budget for a personal plane, not the average flyer. This is jet fuel. And this over here is ethanol. Which Researchers is at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies are looking for solutions for the entire industry. There we go. From figuring out jet fuel blends that produce less emissions to finding ways to cut back on fuel with lighter materials and aerodynamic designs that create less drag. We use these kinds of models in our wind tunnel. Right here. Testing that could ultimately here. benefit the environment and entice airlines. There's a, a hope that if we do things properly, then in the long run, we're still going to be able to fly aircraft and have a reduced impact on the environment. And that's going to require innovations in all kinds of things. Travelers are also under pressure to reduce their own carbon footprint. To fly more A flight shaming movement has taken off, encouraging no, people to not to fly for the planet's sake. Could you take the train instead? Even the Netherlands-based airline KLM is telling people to fly less. Progress towards reducing the total environmental impact of flying is being made, some of it on the ground. Vancouver's airport is swapping gas-powered buses and baggage carts for electric. It costs a little more. An electric co-bus is more expensive than a regular bus. 
and there is a premium, but we're we're investing in the right ways and it makes a difference. For us, reducing our carbon footprint is worth it. Over the past 12 years, the airport authority says it has cut its emissions by 30%. So you see our and a lot could happen in the air over the next two years. Horizon plans to build a full-size version of its hybrid plane. Harbor Air hopes to test its electric prototype and eventually get passengers on board. It's uncharted territory, though, so there could be setbacks. Still, part of a growing effort to propel the carbon-intensive airline industry towards a more sustainable future. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Nice day for a flight. Nice day for just about anything here on the South Coast today. <laughs> yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. That entire segment, I was thinking, man, it would be really great to be able to just get a nice view of the islands today. It has been just such a gorgeous day. The morning started off really nice and sunny. We had a bit of cloud into the early afternoon. But once again, all around, I'm just seeing some blue skies. And with that, we have very, very comfortable temperatures here. I want to show you what we're sitting at right now. You're going to notice something, I think, right away. If you look at the downtown core, even in West Van, we're sitting around 21, 22 degrees. But out toward Abbotsford, the temperature there, 27 degrees. So that is quite noticeable at this point in time, about a 6 to 7 degree change. In terms of our satellite and radar right now, we're not seeing a whole lot. As I mentioned, lots of blue sky and really no rain to be speaking of here. Though we did see a few showers passing over toward the Sunshine Coast a little bit earlier in the day. That's where you're seeing a few of those little blips on the radar there. Aside from that, though, our temperature story continues to be the main story of the weather. We're basically looking at temperatures going down to around 15 degrees for many people, including anyone that would be in the downtown core over toward the Fraser Valley. And in terms of temperatures tomorrow, if you like today, well, honestly, you can rest assured knowing that tomorrow is going to be very similar. Once again, looking at a beautiful daytime high temperature right around 25 degrees. And I think for both tomorrow and the day following, we're going to be seeing a lot of sunshine. So summer is not over yet. I know we think that it's just around the corner of September, but really we've got a few nice days still in here and hopefully we can get out to enjoy it. Hopefully. Thanks, Brett. Talk to you in a bit. Sounds good. A BC company is trying to help make housing a little more affordable. It pairs up students with seniors and middle-aged homeowners. As Brady Strachan reports, the mixed generation living brings unique benefits for everyone. We only need like enough for like um, the both of us. Despite an age gap of nearly 35 years, Colin Ford and Jake Darbyson have a fair amount in common, including a love of Italian cooking. You like fettuccine, right? Yeah, I love fettuccine. Colin owns the home. He was looking for someone to share the space with, so he turned to a Kelowna-based roommate matching website. The website matches students needing a place to live with seniors and middle-aged homeowners. Ford says the arrangement has worked out really well. To me, having a roommate around my own age or somebody older, it's more like equal sharing. Where here, I feel as if I'm providing a space for a young person that can support them, help them, kind of in a mentoring role. It's not the typical college student roommate scenario, but Jake says he quickly realized the benefits of living with someone from a different generation. It's really nice having uh, like a mature role model to be able to uh, talk to when I'm struggling with something. Across town, 83-year-old Alfida Stefuk has opened her home to students as well. Hello. Oh, hello. hello. And who are you? She's taken in medical student Natalia Shishalakova. It's Alfida's second placement with the roommate matching website. There's a tip of the yellow there. A little bit, but this is too small. She likes the companionship of having a younger roommate, and she says Natalia has been a perfect match. Yeah. I, I knew right from the beginning she had common sense. Mm -hmm. I have a tendency to feel it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the website where all the roommate matching occurs is called Happy Pad. Founder Kaylin Libby says it's somewhat like a dating website. Homeowners are matched with students based on their preferences and personalities. He says the benefits are twofold. But if you look in Canada, we have about 12.2 million empty bedrooms. So we see HAPAD as a solution to make these, these empty bedrooms uh, available to people who need an affordable place to live. Right now, most of the matches have been in the Kelowna area, but Happy Pad wants to expand across Canada. The company takes a $50 a month fee from the homeowner and steps in to mediate if problems arise between roommates it matches. Do you want to get the pastor out of the problem? 
As for Colin and Jake, the only challenges they've had living together have been pretty small. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna. Interesting concept. Why not? Yeah, for some, for sure. Yeah, it keeps works people out. company. Mm -hmm. And you can watch this newscast and all of CBC's other award-winning content wherever you go by downloading the free CBC Gem app. Yeah, CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can follow us on all your platforms for extra content you won't see on TV. Radiation levels soar after a rocket engine accident in Russia. After the break, thousands forced from their homes. Okay, vitamin D, uh, bananas, bracelets, stickers. People try a lot of things to try to keep mosquitoes at bay, but how many of them actually work? I didn't know bananas was actually bananas, a thing. Yeah. Science educator Adam McVean separates the facts from the fi fiction and reveals the best way to beat the bite. <laughs> My name is Ada McBean, and I'm a science communicator with the McGill Office for Science and Society. There are so many myths about mosquito repellents. Um, besides just the kind of base chemophobia, people are scared of DEET, even though it works very well and it's been very well researched, it's very safe. But people are scared of it just because it's got a big, long chemical name. Also, there are a lot of old wives' tales, so people think that if you eat a lot of bananas, um, that mosquitoes will be either more attracted to you or repelled from you, depends on who you ask. That's not true. They think that if you take a vitamin B supplement, mosquitoes will be repelled from you, and that's not true. Um, there's all kinds of ideas about what you should or shouldn't wash your hair or clothes with, but in the end it mostly comes down to scents. So you want to stick to unscented products, unscented detergent and shampoo and soap. If you're determined to not put something onto your skin, then your best bet are clip-on devices that go on your belt and they release something called a metoflethrin. And that works, not as well as DEET, but it can work. Essentially, it just uses a fan to distribute a cloud of mosquito repellent around you. Um, likewise, citronella candles use heat to distribute a cloud of repellent around them. They don't work so well, but there is um, candles made of gerianol or linalool, which are components of citronella oil, and those can work a little bit better, but they only work if you stay in one place. So if you're having a barbecue or sitting around a campfire, they might help, but if you're walking in the woods, you're not gonna get any help from wristbands releasing citronella because it can't build up around you. So the first line of defense you should always be looking at is um, physical barriers. So you wanna put nets on your windows, on your doors, you wanna close as many screens as possible, if you can, it'll look dorky, but you should wear the mosquito netting around your head. Um, and especially with babies, because not children under the age of six months and especially two years shouldn't usually be using all types of repellents that adults use. So if you can put them in playpens and cribs and cover those with fine mosquito netting, it's usually a lot safer. Um, and you also wanna wear as much clothing as possible. I know it's not easy when it's 30 degrees, but if you can cover your legs and arms, then mosquitoes are much less likely to bite you. Who knew? Yeah, oh. A lot going on there. Um, but, you know, we're pretty lucky here. I was going to say, we don't have a lot of mosquitoes. No, no screens on the windows. You tell people back east that, you know, no, we don't have screens on the... Or they find out you don't have screens, and they're like, what? I was just having this conversation with someone the yeah. other day. Yeah, but we have zero screens, so... We're lucky, we're lucky. All right, uh, stay with us. We're going to be right back with what's making headlines around the world in just a few seconds. military is recommending the evacuation of an entire village after a deadly explosion. As the CBC's Chris Brown explains, the blast happened during the test of a nuclear-powered engine for a new kind of missile, and now radiation levels have spiked. We still don't know what it was that exploded on that barge outside the Russian Arctic city of Severodvinsk last week, but we do know that as more time goes by, uh, the initial explanation offered by Russian authorities is looking increasingly flimsy. Initially, the Russian Defense Ministry said there was no spike in radiation after the explosion, but today there are new details from Russia's official weather service suggesting, in fact, that yes, radiation did spike by 16 times, although that's not enough to cause any harm to humans. Seven people were killed in the blast. Five of them were top Russian scientists. They were honored 
as heroes at funerals that were held yesterday and their families were told that what they were working on was of national importance. On that point, Russia's nuclear uh, center published this video where scientists tried to go into a bit more detail, suggesting that they were working on a research project uh, that was to generate or create small-scale nuclear power generating devices that could be used, for example, in space or in the Arctic. However, Western intelligence sources say far more likely what was going on was a test of a new weapon, uh, perhaps a highly unstable nuclear-powered cruise missile. NATO refers to this weapon as Skyfall, and it's something that the Russian President Vladimir Putin has talked about even on national TV on a number of occasions. However, there is a lot of criticism, at least from independent media outlets here in Moscow, about the lack of openness. There was an editorial in the paper Novoi Gazeta this morning that was scathing about the secrecy and the potential risks that such experiments pose. Rather than threatening Russia's adversaries, uh, said one editorial, the greater risk is clearly to Russia's own cities. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. To Sydney, Australia now, where one woman is dead, another is in hospital after a man went on a stabbing rampage in the downtown core. Dead people, you just stabbed you, dog! Ah! Witnesses say the man was carrying a large knife and tried to stab several people near a busy intersection. A number of people restrained the man, pinning him to the pavement with a milk crate and a couple of chairs. The man was eventually arrested. A 41-year-old woman was taken to hospital with a stab wound to the back. The body of a 21-year-old woman was later discovered in a nearby apartment. Police say the suspect has a history of mental illness. The apparent jailhouse suicide of multimillionaire and accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein is making waves in the U.S. justice system. There are calls for an investigation into the circumstances of his death, which, as Ellen Morrow reports, has already sparked some changes. Several more lapses have been reported by U.S. media outlets over how accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein was being monitored in jail. The New York Times is reporting that Epstein was not checked on for several hours before he was discovered. According to protocol, Epstein should have been checked every 30 minutes. The Justice Department has temporarily reassigned the warden at the jail where Epstein was being held, and the two officers who were working when he died have been placed on leave. But there are still lots of questions being asked about how these alleged lapses could have taken place with such a high-profile inmate, someone accused of such serious crimes as sex trafficking involving teenage girls, someone linked in the past to a slew of high-profile people, including Donald Trump and Prince Andrew, and someone who had apparently attempted suicide less than two weeks before he actually died. President Trump commented on the case again today, again fueling conspiracy theories, but also calling for an investigation. Basically what we're saying is we want an investigation. I want a full investigation. And that's what I absolutely am demanding. Last night, FBI officials raided Epstein's private Caribbean island, potentially looking for evidence related to co-conspirators. Some of the focus is likely on Ghislaine Maxwell. She's accused of being Epstein's madam, allegedly helping him lure underage girls for sex with him and other high-profile men. Meanwhile, Epstein's alleged victims are expressing anger that he won't have to face them in court. Lisa Bloom is a lawyer for some of Epstein's victims and spoke to CBC News earlier today. One of them said she was so angry at the jail officials who allowed this to happen. It took her so many years to even reach out to me, even to come forward anonymously as she has. It's such a journey to get that far. And she was ready to face him in criminal court. She wanted to see him face justice, uh, get convicted, get a long prison sentence. Now she's been deprived of that. At least some of Epstein's alleged victims are planning to sue his estate worth more than $500 million for damages. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Opera legend Placido Domingo will be facing an investigation over allegations of sexual harassment. The Associated Press says allegations against Domingo go back as far as the late 80s. 
Domingo, a multi-Grammy winner, allegedly pressured women into sexual relationships by promising job opportunities and sometimes punished them professionally if they refused. A total of nine women have come forward. Domingo has denied the accusations. U.S. government backed down on a threat to impose more tariffs on Chinese imports today as uneasy trade talks between the two superpowers continue. Peter Armstrong has a look at how the talks are going. Global markets heaved a giant sigh of relief today. Indeed, the entire global economy has spent the summer increasingly on edge as the world's two biggest superpowers square off. This feels like uh, we were eyeball to eyeball with China and the president just blinked. Trump says he's really just standing up for American consumers. So we're doing this for Christmas season, uh, just in case some of the tariffs would have an impact on U.S. customers. If nothing else, backing down feeds into a narrative that the U.S. is an unreliable negotiator. Trump's tendency to shoot from the hip makes the U.S. sometimes seem erratic. I think China has had a very steady position. Uh, it's uncertain what the U.S. position was. There's so much bluster, so much bluff. China is the opposite. No bluff, no bluster. In Beijing, there's a perception that the U.S. is a threat to the global economy. If the U.S. insists on escalating the trade dispute, this government official says, China will have to take countermeasures. This analyst says the U.S. miscalculated how far China is willing to go. I think it has the abil ability and the willingness to take more pain than the United States does. Uh, the U.S. is in a situation where voters will, will support this until it starts to hit them in the pocketbook. And I think that's exactly what we've seen today. Two words will govern the U.S. and how it navigates these talks, election and recession. Trump wants to get reelected. To do that, he needs to avoid a recession. China, on the other hand, is willing to do anything it can to extend its influence all over the world. And it sees these talks as just part of that. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, more on the protests in Hong Kong and how Canadians are getting caught in the middle.
You're watching CBC Vancouver News, and here is a live shot of Hong Kong International Airport. It is Wednesday morning there. The airport uh, reopened just a short time ago. As you recall, it was closed twice over the past couple of days because of ongoing protests. The protests there on Tuesday turning uh, quite violent, but uh, those suspended and canceled flights, some of them made it out uh, in between the closures, uh, but now the airport has reopened and most airlines have resumed regular service. Police charged into the terminal building trying to disperse the protesters. It's the first time that police have been in action there. The scene turned violent, as Mike mentioned, with each side lashing out at each other. Eventually, the police withdrew, leaving the protesters in control of the terminal building, continuing their demand for political reform. For people in Canada who grew up in Hong Kong or have loved ones there, watching the turmoil from afar is pretty tough. But as the CBC's Arthi Poll shows us, the recent unrest has pushed some people to offer their help. Stop the violence. To, to the young people. Basically. Mimi Lee hopes these messages written by Canadians will inspire protesters in Hong Kong. And we do not stand with Hong Kong. Lee lives in Toronto now, but is originally from Hong Kong and says watching what's unfolding back home is heart wrenching. That's not the Hong Kong that we grew up with. Police should be protecting citizens, and now they are not. People are actually scared when they see the police comes in. She's channeling that frustration into action, organizing rallies in solidarity with protesters. Protesters like this Toronto man who doesn't want to be identified for fear his family in Hong Kong will be put in danger. A lot of my friends are actually asking uh, uh, how, how to apply for uh, uh, immigration. That's what everyone's thinking right now. If they have a family, that's what they're thinking. At the Vancouver airport today, relief from people who just arrived from Hong Kong. Yeah, it's pretty chaotic. It's sad. It's sad. Everybody has a very different opinion. Um, it's, it's, it's far more complicated than what it is. Complex and divisive, even within the Canadian Hong Kong community. For the most part, it's a pretty divisive issue. I think there's a very ingrained uh, Chinese attitude towards you know stability and you know, personal prosperity over like these notions of democracy. Mimi Lee suspects differing opinions in her family too. She has two sisters in Hong Kong and another sister and her mother in Canada. You know, there's really no point in try to argue or you know, like lose a friend over over something that I, I can't see how I can change it. But she won't let it deter her from rallying the community in Canada. She's already planning another event in Toronto this weekend to stand in solidarity with demonstrators back home. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Toronto. A live shot tonight looking toward the North Shore at 6.38 on this Tuesday evening. Temperatures sticking around seasonal. Brett's here with the full forecast next.
it is the biggest celestial show of the year. You got that right. It's that time of the year again because it is the Perseid meteor shower and it reached its peak last night. Conveniently, a stargazer in Japan caught it all on video. Take a look. The annual event happens when the Earth crosses the path of the Swift-Tuttle Comet. This comet sheds debris and creates a dazzling display, kind of like you're seeing here. You can catch the shower on dark nights up until August 26, so if you missed last night, don't worry about it. And the best part, no telescope is actually necessary. However, you will want to get away from the city lights to make sure that you can get the most out of the show. The Perseids themselves can travel at up to 60 kilometers a second, so definitely don't blink too many times because you could probably miss it in that mm. little while. Kind of cool, eh? Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. I, I saw so. a beautiful photo mm. of a, uh, someone took near a shoe swamp as well. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I know. Really it is nice. such a reliable way to stargaze. There's so many cool things to see at this time of the year. Go halfway up awesome. Cyprus. Yeah, exactly. Some of the lookouts up there, you can sometimes. There you go. All right, on the note of beautiful, I did want to show you what it looked like first thing this morning. Over the North Shore Mountains, we had a very nice sunrise. Yet again, another one of those beautiful days. This one, kind of a little bit of a waiting game here, but really, the sun was able to make its beautiful, triumphant return, and then almost really overwhelming the camera here. It was a quite nice day. That said, some other places in the province were not so lucky in terms of what's been going on weather and wildfire-wise. I wanted to show you what's been happening right now for the fire danger rating, just to show you up to the far northwestern portion of the province, mentioning that we do have an extreme danger rating at this point in time. The reason for me to mention this is because of one of the wildfires in particular that just became a wildfire of note. This would be the Tagish Lake. It's about 1,400 hectares, four, excuse me, 1,400 hectares in size. This is up toward Whitehorse, if you can believe it. It is an interface fire, so what that means, unfortunately, is that there is the risk for this fire to interact with some household buildings. There is an evacuation order in effect, and it is quite likely that this was lightning caused. In terms of the biggest concern with this fire right now, it, it really is the winds. We don't mention this a lot, but it is unfortunate because we could be seeing gusts well in excess of 40 to 50 kilometers an hour, if you can believe it. But really, aside from that across the province, there isn't a whole lot going on weather-wise. We are still expecting some rain showers to be pushing in across the southeastern regions of our province. This is going to be more so onto Wednesday, particularly into the East Kootenai. We could be expecting some widespread showers over toward Cranbrook, getting up toward Revelstoke. But really, the rain and where we need it most is going to be headed up to the north by the time that we get to Thursday. We've got a system that's going to be coming down from the Yukon, bringing widespread rain to the Peace region, in addition to at least a few showers up toward the far northwest. So that is some good news. And further good news, I think you're going to like what you see here. If you enjoy the sunshine, we've got two beautiful days coming up, Wednesday and Thursday. Temperatures are going to be very nice into the mid-20s, around 25 and 24, and then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Hard to go wrong here with temperatures right close to seasonal again. 22, 23 degrees, and uh, still not buying the fact that we'd see rain this weekend. I know I, I alluded to that a little bit earlier on in the week here, but I think we're going to be able to make it through relatively dry here in Metro Vancouver. Not too bad. Not too bad indeed. Is that seasonal? It is. There you go. Yeah, there you go. No complaints. <laughs> we were talking about that. What is seasonal oh, yeah. for this time For this time of year, year 22 degrees, in case you wondered. All right. Seasonal is good. <laughs> we like it. Thanks, there you go. Thanks, Brent. Improper treatment, incorrect medications, and infections coming up. How much hospital harm is costing taxpayers?
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Don't miss the Vancouver Queer Film Festival. The festival showcases dynamic and thought-provoking films and provides a vibrant space for queer arts, culture, and community. And join CBC Vancouver at the Love and the Earth Climate Action Fair on August 31st at Riley Park. Learn about the most impactful actions you can take to help our planet. For more on these events, check us out online. The Prime Minister and Toronto's mayor are working together to combat the recent spike in gun violence in that city. There were 14 separate shootings on August long weekend alone. As the CBC's Ashley Burke reports, the politicians say the key to tackling the issue starts with investing in kids and families. This is more than just a courtesy call. It's a pre-election meeting in Vote Rich Toronto and one urgent issue is top of mind, guns. We need action. But Mayor Tory and I agree that we can't simply arrest our way out of this problem. We have to address the root causes of gun violence and get much tougher with criminals who often laugh at things, literally laugh at things like bail and sentencing practices. But what the two leaders haven't agreed on is whether banning handguns is the answer. Toronto is on track to set a record for the highest number of shootings in a year since 2004. In one weekend alone, 14 separate shootings. The spike has renewed John Tory's call for a handgun ban. Trudeau made no promises, only dropped hints. I very much look forward to the election campaign in which we will be able to share with Canadians our vision for how to keep Canadians more safe. The Liberals have taken steps to enhance background checks, improve border control and added restrictions on transporting guns a strengthening that the Conservatives have promised to roll back. Uh, we look forward to the very next time Parliament is sitting, uh, hopefully under a Liberal government, where we will be able to introduce further measures to strengthen uh, measures against, against guns. In a statement, the Conservatives say that Liberal policies senselessly target law-abiding gun owners. Criminals do not register their firearms and they will not comply with arbitrary bans. One expert says a ban on handguns won't stop gang-related gun violence. If we live next door to the largest weapons market in the world, people will just simply drive across the border and obtain their firearms there and then bring them back to Canada. So why won't the Prime Minister take action now? Justin Trudeau wouldn't answer that question today, saying that laws can only be passed when Parliament is sitting, and that won't happen until after the election. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, from drug mix-ups to botched surgeries and accidental falls, besides the obvious health concerns, medical mistakes also cost a lot of money. As CBC's Christine Birak is finding out what changes are being made to address the high price. They are rare, but we know mistakes happen in hospitals. Few are this dramatic. Most involve incorrect drugs and doses. Using more than 600,000 Ontario hospital admission records over a year, researchers found nearly 6% of patients experienced harm during their hospital stay. Most of the mistakes were medication errors, followed by infections acquired in hospital, procedural errors and patient accidents. Those harms led to over 400,000 added days in hospital, costing the province an estimated billion dollars in one year. Any intervention that costs less than 1.1 billion dollars to reduce adverse events would, would be worth it. When they went and grabbed a box, grabbed right instead of left and got the potassium chloride instead of the sodium chloride. The bottles looked similar. A simple substitution error 15 years ago cost Deborah Prouse's mother her life. Other industries that are high risk like aviation would never allow people to die as a result of their services. We need to not tolerate the current level of, of adverse events. It's not about the number of errors, it's about uh, how we study them, how we analyze them and how we learn from them. Enter Black Box, a monitoring system pioneered here at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto is now being used around the world. As in airplanes, it records conversations, along with surgeries, operating room traffic and hundreds of other data points. 
It's found simple distractions can result in serious errors. People coming uh, in the room just to ask how was your weekend and uh, did you watch the hockey game last night? And irrelevant conversation due to critical steps of the procedure. As a result, the hospital is instituting new operating room procedures. While no one expects medical errors to reach zero, everyone agrees the goal is to keep hospital patients as safe as possible. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. A goldfish invasion, how the pets are causing big problems at one Canadian swimming hole. That's coming up. CBC Musical Nooners have returned. It's fantastic. It's our 10th anniversary of free live outdoor concerts every weekday. People can just come and sit down and bring a lunch and have a good time and listen to some inspiring music. For details and the full schedule, check out cbc.ca slash musical nooners. Summertime in Vancouver is hard to beat and like these shows, will be over before you know it. Don't miss out. Well, a popular Canadian swimming hole is brimming with goldfish, likely the offspring of unwanted pets. Yes, they make for unusual swimming companions. Not sure that I would like them slithering against no. me, but they also have the potential to wreak havoc on the local New Brunswick ecosystem. What is swimming around your feet right now? Um, I believe it's goldfish. How many would you say are in here? I've seen about 20 or 30. What's it like to swim with the goldfish? Oh, it's a it's a different experience for sure. Goldfish, it's such a weird thing to see, to be honest, in a public area like this. Goldfish are something we found in and around Greater St. John and across North America really for a long time. It's quite likely, I would think, that it was someone's pet that they released not wanting to care for it anymore or something like that. Goldfish are voracious feeders. They're actually a form of carp from Asia, so they 
do feed a great deal and anything that is that hungry and voracious can outcompete our native everything from brook trout to smaller uh, minnows and things like that. They grow to the size of the environment. You're used to seeing a goldfish at home stays relatively small at most the size of your hand if it's in a tank or a fishbowl. Well, when they're released in the wild, they can grow much larger than that, um, sometimes even a couple feet long. They're the biggest goldfish I've ever seen. They look like big orange carrots. I touched one with my hand. <laughs> what was that like? Like touching a goldfish. <laughs> it was a little slimy. No. Is it kind of like the, uh, is it the pedicure you get with the little fish? Is I think it's one? a little different. That one, they're biting on your toes. I'm not into that either. Yeah, okay. Swim somewhere else. <laughs> okay, a Vancouver Island company says it can make a big contribution to cleaning the area's ocean marinas of surface pollution just by sticking a garbage bin in the water. That sounds a bit unbelievable, but this one's a bit more high-tech than the one we've got at home. Take a look. Sea bin is basically a floating garbage bin. It has a submersible pump that is designed as part of the unit. It sucks the water from the surface through the system and distributes it back into the ocean. And it has a catchment bag to pick uh, out debris, uh, micro and macro plastics as small as two millimeters in diameter. The unit itself can hold up to 20 kilograms of debris. Uh, it'll collect upwards of just under four kilograms per 24 hour period. So tape, plastics, organic debris, which equates up to 1.4 tons of debris in micro macro plastics or any garbage materials uh, over the course of a year. This morning we pulled out some bottle caps, uh, a pop bottle, um, potato chip bags. It costs $7,000 to purchase. So there's a lot of technology that goes into designing something like this. We think it's a small investment to pay to take a small step to cleaning the oceans, to ensuring that debris in our marina and our facilities is, is collected and we're not impacting the oceans. Like you said, a small step, but everything matters. Everything counts. It counts. Expensive, but you know, in a marina area and maybe a little farther up, kind of works, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc, and Dan is here after the National at 11. Yes, he is. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening.